Welcome to my latest YouTube video, Denture Repairs Using Reinforcement Fibers. My name is Tom Zaleski. I independently produce these technique videos for my YouTube channel. I'm the owner of Matrix Dental Laboratory and Consulting and also uh, the Benchtop Editor for Dental Lab Products Magazine as well. Uh, you can reach me on Facebook if you don't already do such. I'm at Zaleski Removable Prosthetics. And my contact information is here, tom at matrixdentalab.com. I've been Matrix Dental Lab since, 19, since 1986. And I chose the name Matrix not because of the movie, because obviously the movie hadn't been out yet, but because Matrix is the foundation or base of something. And um, they use Matrix bands in dentistry and so forth, which produce a foundation. And I thought that was kind of cool, foundation or base of a laboratory uh, that uh, produces removable prosthetics. Anyways, a little bit about me. A uh, little cartoon I used to send back to customers back in the day when I was a salesman in the 70s um, when they wouldn't see me, and that was this little cartoon with a guy that says, no, I can't be bothered with new technology. I've got a battle to fight. It was always got to rise out of some uh, out of most people that I sent it back to. But the point being, and it was kind of cute, is that you always have to be looking at new technology because it's there. Don't get stuck in your old habits of using a sword and shield and look around and see if there's other things out there and always listen and uh, take information in because uh, information is power. Conventional remedies for repairing uh, fracturing, habitually fracking, de fracturing dentures uh, have typically been wrought wire and mesh and so forth. Um, and they look nice, or actually they don't look nice, they look like they might be effective. But in fact, um, because of the flexural properties of the acrylic versus the flexural properties of the alloys, and because of the non-bonding feature of acrylic to alloys, um, these generally are thought of as being a way to keep a denture together once it fractures uh, so that the patient can get back to see the dentist and get it repaired again so it doesn't break in two pieces. It really doesn't prevent long-term any kind of reoccurrence. Um, here's another example of the same thing I'm talking about. These are actually made just for this uh, technique, which is uh, a... Um, a uh, gold wire mesh. I got this off the internet. I always thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I repair dentures uh, in the past, uh, I know the patients and the doctors always complained about the fact that you could see the uh, material that you use for the repair. And in this case, obviously, they made a clear palette so that everybody knew it was there. I just thought it was kind of interesting. I, I, I kind of thought it was contraindicated for the situation. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's a good way to illustrate what we're talking about as far as old-timey type of repairs. One came through my lab, habitually cracking one. We eventually made a uh, a cast pallet, and, and it held up longer, but at the end of the day, uh, it still ended up fracturing and uh, causing a problem. And I think it actually fractured along one of the... Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, extensions. But anyway, uh, I wanted to show you some of these things and and although our intentions are good, it's deeper than just fixing it. We have to look deeper than that. Oh, by the way, here's another repair that I saw off the internet. I thought that was really something. It was done by a patient uh, that was resisting having to come back in and have uh, a repair done. You know, it's a costly thing and they maybe didn't have any money, but I thought it was kind of a novel approach. So as I was getting ready to say earlier, um, it's all well and good that we repair these, but we really have to look further into the situation and come up with the causes. And uh, here is a little uh, thing that I sent one of my doctors on a particular case where I was questioning the causes. And uh, I wanted him to be aware of what we were looking at and some corrective measures that we could take by examining the case overall. One was this had a super long frenum. Basically, that frenum was at the contact area of the central incisors, which, you know, right there tells me that we have an issue. 
Also, this patient did not have a propensity to lose bone, so there was a bulk of bone, and they wanted a thin denture. The denture that uh, was fracturing was at rather thin because anything thicker was causing their lip to look swollen and, and overextended. Um, I also look at the, occlu uh, the occlusal, the opposing occlusal, uh, to a case like this, and in this case, it was a worn out partial lower. Uh, two extensions that were worn below the natural abutments and what was happening here was uh, that this patient was riding on these abutments after these worn and they're looking for a place to chew uh, uh, an incising point or a purchase point and uh, it was tending to wedge the denture I'll show you what I mean so this one here had length of frenum bulk uh, of bone and this uh, this opposing which really needs to be fixed if I was gonna uh, make well when I made a recommendation what I said to do is just put some acrylic over the top of this and let's get a nice flat plane that's even with the rest of the teeth and then we can talk later about maybe rehabbing that lower partial um, wedging is what occurs when you have those kinds of situations or when you have uneasy uneven occlusal wear uh, a lot of times uh, patients don't understand that they need to come back and be reevaluated on a regular basis. They think once they get the denture, if it's staying in and it feels good, that um, they don't need to come back. But obviously, here's a case where wedging, and I see this quite a bit. I'm always asking for an opposing on a case that's been fracturing because I want to see what's going on. In this case, it was the actual denture itself. Uh, but you can see it's very worn flat on the lingual and then very prominent and non-worn buccal facial cusps. And because of this, what's happening is we're getting this wedge, this wedging effect. If the yellow would be the uh, situation of the long buccal cusps and the short lingual cusps because of the wear, and we've got this uneven occlusal situation, and we've got a worn out sun, a saddle, and we've got an abutment it's riding on. You can see what happens is every time the patient bites down, the denture squeezes outward, and because we have a long frenum or at the frenum, it it, it start begins to fracture. Um, there's also we also look at these type of lower cases where oh we're going to repair a lower um, and we go ahead and the doctor prescribes a cast reinforcement well the problem with that is again as I mentioned earlier is a the the flexural properties of the acrylic and the flexural properties of the alloy are different so it lends itself to separation and delamination at some point but also on the lower there is a uh, deformation of the mandible during mastication and movement and because of that what happens is the denture tends to move in and out spreads in and out it goes outward then it comes inward when it when the pressure is taken off well what that does is that creates a stress area here a fatiguing area which doesn't immediately fracture but over a period of time it continues to expand and contract because it's being forced out and then coming back inward again it's almost like taking a piece of alloy in your hand or a piece of wire and bending it back and forth back and forth back and forth back and forth until it finally you know fatigues and breaks well it's the same basic uh, premise here the fatiguing not only causes the delamination from the wire but it also causes this acrylic to fail at some point so um, again, not a really great idea to be putting metal in there because you have uh, uh, an extra added property that's uh, uh, working against you. And that is, like I said, the delamination of, and the flexural properties that aren't the same. Um, with a lot of the uh, implant and or uh, restored abutments with locators, uh, we have the issue of doctors and and laboratories not understanding that uh, dentures fabricated with this type of retention moda modality are exactly that uh, they're retained dentures not supported and thusly if we do not get a bunch of if we don't get relines and if the patient doesn't come in for uh, regular checkups what happens is uh, as the case uh, functions uh, the, the support is being laid on the locators and then what eventually happens is uh, that we start to get uh, a fracturing around the attachments. Um, then what do we do? Well, hopefully we reline it and get it back into shape, but it's already started its situation, so we have to think of ways to prevent that from occurring over a period of time or a way to at least extend the time before it occurs the next time. And again, remember, this is 
uh, the, uh, O-rings or locators, they're being held in a position where they are uh, activated, but they are not retaining by support. They are re retaining by the activation of the mechanism of the button. And so it's important that uh, they're, they're placed and cured in in a what I call a passive state. Although they're engaged, they're passively sitting engaged without any pressure on them. The pressure is coming from the actual ring inside. So if you got these cases where you're getting support, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, a lot of times where it happens is these they do a bunch of adjustments, and the next thing you know, the denture's riding on these. If that occurs, you got to go back and you have to realign these cases because it has to be mutual. The tissue around is what supports it, and then the retention, it's mutually retained. The retention is only from the activation of the button and not, again, like I said, uh, by support. Um, this is the situation. You begin to get the corners of the buttons or caps begin to start to pressure. You get fatigue areas, fracture points, and eventually this will fail because it's pushing upward. Well, um, you can prevent some of that. Um, I'm recommending using some fiber over the top of each one of the buttons. You'll buy yourself some more time, especially if it's a doctor who you habitually have these type of cases where the buttons pop through and he doesn't get the fact that he's got to uh, uh, take a passive pickup impression so that these can be, uh, the attachments can be activated without support, uh, without supporting the denture that is. So again, you know, lay a little fiber. And we're going to talk about fiber because that's the looking outside the box kind of thing that I'm suggesting. And that is, there are several out there, Preet and Fiber Force. There's, there, there's several of them out there. Um, but if you're going to use the fiber, there's some things you need to be aware of. And that is position or placement of it. Where do you place that fiber? Well, typically, if you read the research, you got to put it as close to the fracture point as possible and at the surface as close to the surface as possible um, uh, because you have to start uh, stop it from ever starting. It's also good to have a bonding or silation, silination layer on the fibers. Um, I like the Fiber Force product for that reason. That it has a silinated layer. It's a sticky layer, which when the, the denture is cured against it, it bonds to it. You also have to worry about the direction and how much of the material you use. Direction meaning if this was the, the fracture, you always want to be perpendicular and not parallel to the fracture because you want to, uh, uh, mechanically, you want to keep that from fracturing again. Okay. Uh, so we have position and placement, bonding, and direction and bulk. Here's a little diagram. I think I got it from Chris over at Preet that was on his website. Just about where's the right and wrong place. If you're getting a midline fracture, the right position is as close to the fracture as possible and not back here because the fracture has all this time to propagate all the way back. Um, by staving it off right at the beginning, it never occurs. So here's a case I get in. It gets kind of nasty, and and uh, it's been repaired. The doctor calls me, and I say, okay, uh, fix it in house, and then uh, schedule with the patient, and we'll do a repair with a reline. Um, I'm not going to repair a cold cure. I want to do the whole thing in one fell swoop because that's the best way to do it. Um, we'll guarantee uh, more longevity, especially if I remove those factors that I mentioned earlier about wedging and so forth. Uh, we have a, a much better chance of it surviving for you know, a long period of time or maybe even indefinitely. So this comes in, and uh, my next step, of course, is to box and pour the impression. I use the Wonderfill and Wonderformer. I box all my impressions, even the, re the reline ones. This might be a suspect reline. I don't, uh, uh, suspect reline impression, but I... I treat them all the same. I want if these borders are the way the borders are, I've got to be able to capture them. Um, and a box and pouring uh, the impression takes five minutes with the Wonderfill, um, and I got to pour it up anyways. It at least gives me the thicknesses and lengths of the borders the way I need them. Gives me a nice finished model and a very well adapted model because it's using gravity in reverse. The stone is poured into this, and so it lays up next to the impression really nice. So anyways, I get myself the master model. And then once I do, then I invest it in the uh, in my lower end of the flask. I'll take some some wax, and you'd noticed earlier. I might you might have seen where the repair was made. I smooth that all out, 
Um, and basically, if I have to, I'll even wax in new contours in here, or at least make it smooth so that when I encompass the uh, the denture in the flask for the second pour or the capping pour uh, and I cover it with putty that whatever it looks like on the surface is how it's going to be picked up in detail on the laboratory putty but anyways I lay the laboratory putty on top a finger adapted all the way around make sure it's adapted and I just expose the incisors and just the cusp tips through the material not very much just enough so you can see it really not sticking out and while it's still soft I'll put some retention uh, holes or grooves in the material so that when I pour the cap over the top it retains the putty in the upper half of the mold once it's set up I remove the denture from the stone now I, I have the the uh, option to trim away as much as I want. In this case here, I blow a little air underneath. It makes it easier to pull it out. Uh, but then I'm able to trim the entire fracture area away and any areas that might have plasticized resin, and I'll explain. There's the mold. I've removed the denture. There's my denture mold. I'm going to be able to reinsert the denture in there once I've removed all the bad acrylic. And here's the model. So I remove now all the fractures. In this case, I took the centrals off. These are um, porcelain teeth. So I took the centrals off, and I stuck them back in the upper half of the mold. And then I cut out this entire area wherever I saw fractures. This case also had been long-term with some pla uh, tissue conditioner. And the tissue conditioner has plasticizer in it, which attacks the hard acrylic. It, the plasticizer keeps the, the uh, soft liner or the... I should say the tissue conditioner, temporary soft liner or tissue conditioner, soft, is also a plasticizer which can attack the acrylics on the denture, so uh, the hard acrylics. So I go in there and I really just go to town and I get all that old stuff off because if I do the reline and leave any area with plasticizer on the surface, what will happen is the denture will soften from the inside and fracture outward. And it's a good thing to keep in mind if you're getting the denture that's coming in and it's fracturing and you can't figure out why it keeps fracturing and they have at some point had a um, tissue conditioner in their dentures. And I'll tell you a, a perfect example is the uh, stuff from KC Dental, the uh, stuff that Dr. Pound uses, the Hydrocast, Dr. Turbifill. The hydrocast material is definitely has plasticizer, which will attack the surface and over a period of time, especially if they're going through long-term tissue conditioning. So it's a good thing to get it all off the surface. Anyways, I remove all the material, make sure I have a nice butt joint all the way around. And then I reinsert the denture back in the upper half, and you'll notice I have some fiber. And what I did was I took a couple strands or ropes of the fiber, the uh, reinforcement fiber, which is basically Kevlar, and I go around the pins between the central incisors, which have, uh, which are um, uh, uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum porcelain teeth, uh, vacuum-fired porcelain teeth, and uh, so they have pins. So what I figured is if the if I've got a frenum fracture, why not just put that. Uh, right across at the point where it's going to propagate as I mentioned earlier and it'll tie these centrals in and just give me more support and again you'll notice the surface has been sandpapered it's got surface treated this is reinserted and um, then I'm going to add some mesh not only where the incisors were but I'm also going to add some mesh in this area and you might ask why and it's a peace of mind issue belt and suspenders if you want to call it that if one fails I got the other to keep it, you know, to buy me time, to buy more longevity on the case. Um, again, if if the if your doctor doesn't take your recommendations to remove the wedging, or to rebuild the occlusal on a worn partial or opposing denture, um, you're going to have the situation reoccurring, um, regardless of what material that you use. This will buy you more time, but it's eventual. It's going to fracture again if you don't remove those issues. Well, because I'm going to put mesh in there, I in this area, I have to be able to define that area with, uh, and I have to use a block out of wax to, to uh, give me a sandwiching effect for the fiber. So the spacer that I make is made out of fiber force wax. It's 26 gauge. I can't find another one that thickness. It's a 0.5 or a half a millimeter thick, which is an ideal thickness for placing the fiber in between two layers of acrylic. As you can see here, I, I measured it out. 
but uh, here's how I get that dimension. If I have this space and I have to put the actual fiber in and I need to block that area out, what I do is, I call it to be meshed, I take that, um, that wax sheet and I place it over that area and then I take my thumb and press down and what it'll do is it'll pick up an imprint of this area and then I can trim that with my scissors um, uh, to that shape and then I will lay that shape over the top of my fiber material. Now the fiber material is blue in color here because it's covered with packaging because it has a light cure activation in it. Uh, it's a fi the fiber force material and it's light cured uh, to maintain its uh, its shape uh, prior to being processed. Not that it makes it stronger, but it holds it in position by curing it in into the shape that you, whatever you you cure it in. This keeps the memory from the fiber from springing out and causing it to change position while you're flasking, packing your I should say packing your case. So I lay, so I literally lay this little shape over a sheet of the material and then follow it and cut it out so that I can place uh, not only the, the uh, wax spacer in, but also that the wax spacer and the mesh are the same shape. In other words, this area now has been defined by the wax, which I transferred that shape to the fiber. I've trimmed the fiber through that blue deal, laid it on the model itself, and then put it in the light cured oven. It's sticky at this point, so I was able to lay it in my light cured oven and cure it in this position so that it would stay in this curved shape when I go to pack it. So I check to make sure the space is right. If I have any hanging over the edge, I'll trim it back, but that's pretty much there. And again, uh, the patients like to see something under there, even if it's not real Obtru you know, obtrusive. At least they see that there's mesh, and if you hold it up to the light, you can prove you've done it, because like I said, I have doctors that go, well, I didn't see any repair in there. Are you sure you repaired it? This way, there's there's that added extra benefit of having a mesh in there. Before I start to trial pack my case, I use a bonding liquid. In this case, it's the Palabond uh, from Horaeus Kulzer. And there's also Vita Call out there from Vita, uh, from the uh, Vita company. And they will uh, uh, also have this material. It's a, um, it's a, a, a solvent it's a monomer solvent rather than that sticky gooey stuff that we usually use I use this stuff on the backs of my teeth too on my uh, resin teeth uh, it's, it's just another way of having the belt and suspenders in case one thing goes bad you've got the bonding of the material um, I, I give it two layers the first layer I call a wash layer and then I let that dry and then that wash layer basically takes off anything that might be on there that might restrict the adhesion and then just before I, about 10 minutes before I pack, I'll put on a very thin second layer. And I put it on all the butt joints, every place where acrylic is going to come in contact that I want to have a good, a good solid contact. Then I'll go ahead and trial pack with the wax spacer in place. What I'll start doing is my first pack is generally I put a little sausage of material in here and I'll close the flask. And what it'll do is it'll give me just this little outline here of this area. This will be all open still. And then what I did was I took and I placed uh, this piece of wax in there. And then uh, trial packed it a second time, added, trial packed it a third time until what I get is the wax is adapted with a, a space and the borders are uh, are not overly going out to the edge and they've been trimmed and this is like uh, ready to go so what I'll do is I'll pick this wax out and that will leave me a amount of acrylic underneath of this and then I will place the the um, uh, the mesh over the top uh, in that area where that space was provided by the mesh I'll show you what I mean I'll place it in there and then I'll stick a little bit of acrylic in here. I'll put another packing sheet in and I'll do one, one final trial pack. And what that will do is that will cover this. And so what it will do is create a sandwich. You'll have the outside layer will be acrylic, the mesh, and then that little ball that I put on top of it will be the third layer. So it'll all be encompassed into that area and it'll be sandwiched in. Um, make sure that um, when you close your flash, you don't close the flash straight down, but add, insert the anterior first and then 
lower the posterior down on the pins. If you come straight down, there's a chance you're going to squeeze out material and m make some movement. You want to make sure that this, this is the first area that gets compressed so that it presses it in this area. So then once it's all pressed and you open it up and you pull your sheet out and it, you can't see the mesh, it's under the surface now, then you would close it final and you would process and finish it. Uh, I process eight hours using the Super Nature Curl on this case. Um, super, uh, the Nature Curl Super High, high uh, Impact is what they call it. It's their high impact acrylic. It's the one that I'm using. Um, I tried to match up the shade as best I can. This statue was made 10 years ago. I'm sure that the acrylic itself had changed a little bit in color. It was rather close, but what really impressed me was uh, the finish that was obtainable on the old acrylic and then on, of course, the new acrylic as well. And uh, I always take great care to get it right back up to pristine condition again because uh, I want to make sure that we don't get any micro adhesions of of plaque or anything on the denture and um, it's uh, kind to the patient's tongue. I don't want them to feel any kind of marker line. Um, the acrylic got a good shine on it, not only because it's good acrylic, but because also I'm using the uh, Resolute product from Renfert in this case and uh, works extremely well to get that final high shine. If you're interested in how I get those final shines on my cases, uh, just send me an email and uh, if I get some interest, I'll definitely put on a, a webinar or a uh, a video for you guys or gals uh, on this if you're interested. Um, here's the facial of that same case and you can see um, it blended in very well. There's very, very little that you can tell uh, has been uh, replaced. And this is the kind of repairs that uh, hopefully won't come back until the patient's uh, ready for a brand new denture. Um, the way the economy is nowadays, we try to buy people as much uh, time as we can on their appliances. You'll notice this has a diastema. I called the doctor. I said, when you place these together, you know, you left a diastema. Did it have one before? He said, no. I said, okay, well, I just have to let you know that once you've put the denture together using either super glue or something else and then taken in a reline impression, we're stuck with those positions. And you'll notice here I actually ran a little acrylic down because we would have had a diastema there and we would have had, had some issues. So I tried to run the acrylic down as far as I could to, to obscure this. But, again, make sure you tell your doctors that if they're going to take that reline impression into a midline fractured denture to make sure they articulate them together as close to proximity as possible because whatever they send back is what you're going to have to process it with. Anyways, again, you can just see the finish. I got that with Resolute and the acrylic itself is great. You know, there are preventative steps that we can do to buy us even more time in these cases when we're fabricating them new. Here's one where I was mentioning earlier that you want to encompass the uh, locator or stud attachment, implant attachment in... Uh, in fiber before you go ahead and process this. This will buy you some time. But again, nothing's going to beat the fact that if the doctor allows the case to be um, supported by the attachments, there's no there's no way that uh, after a certain length of time, you're going to have issues unless you get it relined and get everything supported again by the tissue. But this is just another way of uh, assuring that you get some more time out of the deal. Here's one where I don't believe in putting fiber over the whole thing. Tom, is there something we can do besides like a wire mesh or something? Sure. Here's a mesh of fiber. I put it over the crest to the ridge. There's some tissue stops in that so that there's a space underneath. Um, these techniques are on, are on videos. If you want to see me do it, just contact me again. I'll be happy to illustrate them in a video on how you position this in place, but hopefully this is going to buy this patient some more time and that the doctors also eliminated some of the existing conditions um, uh, occlusally and wear-wise that uh, will prevent that from occurring again. Um, this one, as I showed earlier, had a deep, deep frenum, like almost at the contact area, uh, short of a frenectomy, which would be like a snip of the frenum and a stitch. Uh, we have to figure out a creative way to do this. So I lay a piece of mesh over it and I cut it out. And then I cure it like cure wise around that area. And then when I go to cure this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to cure that so that this if this is the propagation point, as you can see, I have that all fiber reinforced. And uh, that should prevent it from uh, occurring again. This case never came back. So I'm a, I'm assuming that it did its job because I still work for the doctor. But uh, we also did eliminate the other issues. There were some other issues like 
uh, wear on the occlusal and so forth. So, you know, in, in tandem with the repair are the adjustments and corrections. You know, what drives me crazy is people think that, a re, you know, treat the way they treat these repairs. Get them in, get them out. Um, and that's all well and good. I know the patients are waiting for something. But, but you know, you really got to analyze these cases and you got to find out what the underlying reason for all this is occurring and then act on those as well as using this reinforcement uh, type of products because, again, if they're not going to last forever as long as that exists. And remember, if there's a bad condition there, such as an occlusal wear situation or so forth, it's only going to get exacerbated over time. It's going to get worse. And pretty soon, <clears throat> it's not going to matter what you use. It's still going to fracture. So, again, look at the underlying reasons. I showed you some of those earlier. So, remember... You know, the way it works is you think outside the box, you become a technical resource for your doctors. I gave you several great ideas on what to look for and what to suggest to them so that you can make these type of corrections, so they can make these kind of corrections clinically, hopefully, we'll take your suggestions. But, um, hey, if you are stuck with a situation where you're being asked to warranty something, at least you'll have something to fall back on and say, hey, I, I showed you where we had a uh, remiss situation and uh, you didn't want to correct it, and I told you it was going to continue to occur until such time as we uh, had it corrected. So uh, with that being said, thanks for coming to my video again. Uh, checking out my YouTube channel, 67,000 views so far. Really uh, excited about that. I appreciate your attendance and your support. Hope to see you again. And if you get a chance, become a subscriber. I have 126 of you. Um, when you subscribe, anytime I put a new video on, it automatically alerts you to that fact. So uh, please uh, take advantage of that. Again, thanks for your attendance. Have a great day. Thank you.